Habakkuk is for today. And uh, the, the title of the message is this, Stand Guard. Everybody say it with me, Stand Guard. Look at somebody close to you and tell them, Stand Guard. We must stand guard. We got to watch. We got to pray. We got to be people who stand guard. Now, you're going to think, when you think stand guard, the first image that comes to your mind, I bet, is you got to stand guard against the enemy, right? If an enemy is coming, you got to stand guard, stand your ground, be ready. And how many believe we need to be as followers of Jesus? Yes, but that is not my message today. We're going to get into it and see what the Lord wants to say to us. Habakkuk is uh, talking to God. It's a short, short um, book, three chapters long. And uh, I'm going to jump into the first chapter, read it all. My message is mainly out of chapter two, but chapter one provides a good foundation uh, for what's to come. And so we're going to jump right into this and, and, and see what is going on. This is right around the t- time that the Babylonians are coming or about to come and, and conquer Judah. And, um, and this is when Habakkuk is prophesying, is around the time of the uh, end, or at least in that season, of the end of Judah, and, um, and as people were going to go into exile. So this is the message that the prophet Habakkuk received in a vision. Everybody say the word vision. Very important word for today. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not, what? Oh, has anybody ever felt like God is not listening? Oh, just a whole bunch of you are like, no, I'm holy. You know, I just know God is always listening and always paying attention. I never have that question. Yeah, right. You have been through so many th- seasons in life and you're going, God, are you listening, right? Are you there? What is going on? And Habakkuk is like, God, you do not listen. Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumbered the righteous so that justice has become perverted. Okay, really important. Who is he talking about? He's talking about his people, about the people of Judah, and he's saying that there is injustice, things are not right, and what is he asking God to do? He's like, God, I need you to show up, and I need you to change this, right? I need you to show up and get people back on the right track. I need you to show up and bring justice. I need you to do what you do, God, and how many think that's a good prayer, right? And so so Habakkuk is saying this to God, and watch out, because when you th- just when you think that God isn't listening, verse 5 says, the Lord what? Which means God was listening. And the Lord replied and said, look around at the nations. Look and be amazed, for I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. Now stop right here. If I'm Habakkuk and I've just prayed for God to do something big in Judah, something big in like Los Angeles, and like, yes, God, would you do something huge? There's a lot of injustice and a lot of bad things and everybody's fighting. And God's like, I am going to do something right now that you wouldn't even believe if someone told you. And if I'm Habakkuk, I'm like, praise God, right? Would you be like that too? Praise God, this is going to be amazing. And then verse 6, I am raising up the Babylonians. And I bet Habakkuk is like, that's not what I had in mind. I was hoping you would show up and like change everybody's hearts. Oh, Lord God, give them a new heart, a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone. What is this about the Babylonians? I am raising up the Babylonians, a cruel and violent people. They will march across the world and conquer other lands. They are notorious for their cruelty and do whatever they like. Their horses are swifter than cheetahs and fiercer than wolves at dusk. 
Their charioteers charge from far away like eagles. They swoop down to devour their prey. On they come, all bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind, sweeping captives ahead of them like sand. They scoff at kings and princes and scorn all their fortresses. They simply pile ramps of earth against their walls and capture them. By the way, um, real quick note, uh, if you ever take a trip to Israel, we're going to get a trip going to Israel one of these days. But if you ever take a trip to Israel, um, you can actually see a place called Masada where uh, there were ramps of earth built up to the top of this plateau. And uh, they don't get to the top anymore. They're about halfway up kind of the mountain. And uh, in that case, it wasn't the Babylonians. It was the Romans in the early A.D. years that, that did it. But it is a sight to behold how literally they would build entire new like mountains of earth in order to bring up their army over a wall of a city. It is something else. And so they simply pile ramps of earth against their walls and capture them. They sweep past like the wind and are gone, but they are deeply guilty. Who's deeply guilty? The Babylonians. For their own strength is their God. And I want you to think just for a second with me. And, and this first chapter is kind of hilarious to me because Habakkuk is saying to God, God, Judah, everybody's behaving badly. Could you come and do something? Like, could you come and change everybody? And God answers and says, yeah, I'm going to respond. And here's my response. I'm sending the Babylonians to destroy you. And so Habakkuk responds to God in verse 12, and he says, O Lord my God, my Holy One, you who are eternal, surely you do not plan to wipe us out. Right? He's like, I, I wanted your help. I didn't think you were going to destroy us. O Lord our rock, you have sent these Babylonians to correct us, to punish us for our many sins. But you are pure and cannot stand the sight of evil. Will you wink at their treachery? Should you be silent while the wicked swallow up people more righteous than they? Are we only fish to be caught and killed? Are we only sea creatures that have no leader? Must we be strung up on their hooks and caught in their nets while they rejoice and celebrate? Then they will worship their nets and burn incense in front of them. These nets are the gods who have made us rich, they will claim. Will you let them get away with this forever? Will they succeed forever in their heartless conquests? Habakkuk is full of questions. Have you ever been at a place in your life where you have more questions than answers? And this is the place where he finds himself. He's praying to God. He's asking God to answer him. God answers him in one way, yet he ends up with many more questions, and he is simply not sure what is going on, what is going to happen, and he's in a difficult situation. And what I want to preach about today is what do you do? What do you do when nothing makes sense? What do you do when it seems like the world or your world is falling apart? What do you do in those moments? And I believe Habakkuk gives us a clear pattern of life that we can follow about what to do when we come across and come into those moments of life where we have more questions than answers. And how many believe that God has a word for us today? And so in chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, we're going to get a picture of what Habakkuk does and how we should live as well, as well as what the Lord does for us his children. He says the following. In fact, I'm going to ask everybody to just read verse 1 together with me. What does it say? I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. There I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. Now this verse is actually really powerful and really important. You see, he says these words, I will climb up to my watchtower and I'll stand guard. I'll stand 
at my guard post. Now, the watchtower was a tower that was built up in a city, in the walls of a city in those days. So that way, the, the, the people of the city, the guards, would be able to stand guard and see if an enemy was coming from far away. Now, um, I, I do believe that the earth is round. I'm pretty sure most everybody believes that. And uh, if you believe it's flat, God bless you. And, um, but, uh, no, but I believe it's round. And so you, you would have a tower. And as you climb up into the tower, the higher you go, watch this, the farther you can see, right? If you've been in a plane, you know that that's true. The higher you are, the farther you see. And so they would build up these towers because they would climb up and they could see the enemy coming from far away. Now, is uh, Habakkuk actually going into a physical watchtower here? No. This is a spiritual sense that he's talking about, about how he's going to go up into a watchtower. But what I, I, I want you to understand is, well, you can climb up into the watchtower and you can see an army coming from far away. What do you do when the army is already at your gate? What do you do when the Babylonians, they're coming, you have no way out of it. He knew that they were going to show up. He knew that the enemy was coming. He knew, according to what God had said, that Judah stood no chance. So why in the world would he metaphorically climb up into a watchtower? Well, there's a second reason why a person might climb up into a watchtower. The first one is to see the enemy coming from afar off, yes. But once the enemy is close by and you know that they're coming, why would you then still climb up into the watchtower? And here it is. Because you would be looking and hoping for help to come. You'd be watching, hoping, waiting. Is there another army coming? Maybe you had sent emissaries, ambassadors. You had sent messengers to another nation saying, hey, you know what? If you guys come to help us against the Babylonians, by the way, they did this with Egypt. They were hoping for Egypt's help. And so if you come to help us, we'll give you all the treasure in our temple. So would you come to help us? So if they send like a whole bunch of money out to Egypt or whoever, you'd go up, you'd have the guard going up into the watchtower and sitting there and what are you hoping to see? You already know the Babylonians are coming. You're hoping to see your allies coming behind them because if they're coming, then the enemy is sandwiched between you and the city and your allies on the other side and you can defeat the enemy. Is anybody with me right now? And so the second reason you walk up into the watchtower is because you're looking for help. Which one is Habakkuk doing in prayer? Because we actually need to pray both ways. Sometimes we have to stand guard because we have an enemy who walks around like a lion seeking whom he may devour. So sometimes our standing guard is standing guard, paying attention to the enemy and what he's doing. But a lot of times when we are struggling, when things are difficult, when stuff is going on, we get up into our spiritual watchtower, not to watch the enemy, but to watch for Jesus. And this is what he chooses to do. He says, I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. I will stand guard. Then he says, there I will what? Oh, I need more people now. There I will what? There I will wait. He's literally telling God, God, you say the Babylonians are coming. I got a bunch of questions. And so, God, I am climbing up the tower, and I am waiting here until you speak to me. And I will not go until you speak. You see, here's the thing. What do we typically do when difficulties have come our way? What do we typically do? I'm going to give you three wrong things that we do. Here's the first one. 
The first one that we do is we, we, we think, you know what, fine, fine. Everything's difficult. Everything's hard. I'm just going to figure it out my own way. And I'm going to move forward on my terms, with my ideas, with my strategies. That is a mistake. Everybody say mistake. That's mistake number one, right? You're just going to be like, you know what? Screw it. I'm doing what I think is best to do. And I'm just going to move forward. Wrong. Mistake number one. Mistake number two is you're stuck in this place, you got more questions than answers, the difficulties have come, and you start looking back, you start looking to the past. And, 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 and let me be clear, when you start looking to, get to the past, you remain stuck in that space. And you go, well, so some of you, you remember how good it used to be, right? Has that been your case for anybody? You're like, back in the days, before the Babylonians, things were good. I had some ribeye steak, and you know, my, my kids would play in the yard outside, and we'd go and play soccer or football or basketball or baseball or whatever every Tuesday night, and we had a good time, and, and you're stuck in the past. That's mistake number two. Mistake number three, you look to the future, but you're filled with fear and dread and worry because the future is unknown, and you start wondering what's going to happen. And I imagine Habakkuk w could have been in the same situation, right? He's thinking, these Babylonians are going to show up, and they're going to kill us, and they're going to do what they're going to do, and this is a horrible place to be. And by the way, he had this question of God, did he not? He's like, are you bringing the Babylonians to completely wipe us out? Is that the future? Is that what's going to happen? And so how does Habakkuk respond to all of this? That's mistake number three. You can go Go it on your own. But my friends, even Moses declared, I will not go unless your presence goes with me. Are you with me? Amen. Come on, we can give an applause to God right now. You can, you, you can go it on your own, but that's disaster. You can look towards the past, but you'll stay stuck right where you are. You can look to the future and start worrying about the unknown, but you stay stuck just as much. But there is a different way, my friends. There's a different way. And I bet that everybody in this room has followed one of those three ways in your life. But there is a different way. And what is the way that Habakkuk shows to us when you got the struggle, when you have the difficulty, when you have more questions than answers, he says, God, I am going up and I am standing guard and I am waiting until you speak. I ain't moving until you say something, God. And this is what he does. In fact, just so you know, when he says, I will wait to see, everybody say, wait to see. What he's really saying is I will watch to see. I will watch to see. Now that sounds like a contradiction because some of you are thinking, how can you watch if you cannot see? Well, what are you talking about? Well, go back to the watchtower concept. The guard would go and stand in the tower and he would be watching in order to see what was coming. And so the call here of Habakkuk and what he is saying is, God, I'm going up the watchtower, but I am watching for you. And I am watching until you show up. And I will stay here with my eyes fixed on Jesus until, Jesus, you show up with something for me. And I ain't going until you show up. And let me be clear, I'm not saying that Jesus is showing up with the answer you're looking for. What I'm saying is that you're waiting for Jesus to show up with an answer, period. It's his answer, not mine. And it's not only that, he says, I will watch to see what the Lord says or what the vision, everybody say the word vision, that's what's in the Hebrew, it's the vision of the Lord, it's the, 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 the word chazown in the Hebrew, and, and it's, it's the vision of the Lord, and he's saying, I will watch until I see the vision of the Lord. 
I will watch until I see it. And I'm not going anywhere. I will stand guard with my eyes fixed on Jesus until Jesus responds. And then we get to verse 2. And how does verse 2 begin? Then the Lord said to me. And you know what's interesting? How long was Habakkuk doing verse 1 for? Was he in his spiritual prayer watchtower for a minute? For an hour? For a day? A week? A month? How long did it take? We have no idea how long it took. But can I just tell you something today? That God delights in revealing things to his children. He really does. The problem is we tend to be massively impatient. And so we want the answer as quick as we want it to be rather than saying, okay, God, I'm just going to stop here. I'm going to fix my eyes on you and I'm going to wait until you show me what to do. But I need the answer right now. Would you wait until God speaks? And so what did the Lord tell him? He said this, write my answer or write the vision plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. And so God is telling him, all right, I've got a vision for you, Habakkuk. What you have been waiting for, I am going to give it to you. But what you need to do is you need to write it down on tablets. By the way, some of you might do this. I do this, not on tablets, by the way. Um, but, uh, but, but I write down, when the Lord gives me a word, it might be a prophetic word, it might be a dream, it might be something he gives me directly, it might be something that he gives to me through somebody else, but I actually, I, I use a program for all of my notes called Evernote. And uh, in, in Evernote, I write down everything. My preachings are in there, and, and every word from the Lord is in there, and I've got devotions from my devotional time in there. Everything's in there. And, and so when somebody gives me a word from the Lord, I put it in there, and I actually tile, title it, Word from the Lord, and I put the date on it. And so that way, at any moment that I want to, I can go back and I can search up word from the Lord and the list of these words that God has spoken, I can read again. And my friends, there are many times in your life where you need that word because you are in a season and you're like, I don't know what's going on, but I remember God spoke six months ago and I need to grab that again because God is speaking and I need to hold on to that. It's good to write it down, my friends. That's why I encourage people to take notes when, when, when the preacher's preaching. Why? Why? Because while you're writing, God might speak something to you. And so you take notes, or some of you more like, take notes, you know. But whichever way works for you, because when you put it down, you can run with it. But by the way, Habakkuk, he's receiving the message from God. He's receiving the vision from God, but then he's giving it to a runner who was going to take the message and to declare it to other people so that way they would know about it, right? And there are messages that sometimes God gives that are not just for me or they're not just for you. They're for other people as well. And it's good to have it down so you can send it out and bless other people with it. Is anybody uh, blessed by that? When you've gotten a word from somebody else and then God is like, man, this person needed to send it out and you received it and you go, amen, I'll take a hold of that, right? And, and so that's what we need to do. And then God tells them this. He says, this vision is for a what? This vision is for a what? A future time. This vision is for a future time. But see, he waited. He waited until God gave it to him. That does not mean that the vision God gives is always for right now. Let me tell you something. We are, um, as a church, we're growing. Um, we have two services that are full. This service, as well as our 8 a.m. service, have slowly been adding. And in the last month, we've seen more people coming than ever before. And if you're new with us in the last few weeks, we're, we're happy to have you with us. And, um, and, and we're 
quickly getting to a place where space is going to be a massive issue for us. And so you start thinking about, well, what do we do? And can we build something? And what's it going to take? And that's a process that requires time and a process that also requires, uh, anybody know? Money, right? And, uh, and our long-term plans to build is going to cost multiple millions of dollars. And it's like, how do we do that? And by the way, I, I have a sense from the Lord that we're not going to really do it. It's just going to happen. And, and what I mean by that is not that you won't give. Of course, we'll all give. But it's just going to happen very naturally and organically. And the Lord is going to just make it work. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of churches, and by the way, I, I, I'm not speaking against any church on the planet that does this, because um, I've done similar things before, um, but, uh, but a lot of churches that do specific, like, campaigns, and they're like, so if you give $500, we'll give you a free keychain that says, praise God for Vida Church, you know, and then uh, if you give $1,000, we'll give you five t-shirts that say Vida Church is amazing, and uh and then if you give like $5,000, you get dinner at Ruth's Chris with the senior pastor and his wife, and it'll be amazing, and God bless you, you know? And, and you think up of all these campaigns, and I'm not anti any of those things, but I've had a direct sense from the Lord that it's just going to come. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come. It's going to happen. And so what do you do? What do you do when you're in a situation where you're going, God, we're growing and we're running out of space, but we need millions of dollars and we don't have the human way to make this happen. What, what do we do? Well, I don't know. But here's what I do know. Here's what I do know. That the Lord has given us dreams about our future building. Not just me, other people as well. And so what do I do? Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 2. If the Lord showed it, he's going to do it. And it's for a future time. And I might be sitting right here going, I have no idea how it's going to happen. But God, you have given a vision. And because you gave a vision, I know it's going to happen. And I'm not worried about it. Because when God gets you a vision, you now understand something about the future that gives you peace for the current moment right now. And then you can begin walking. By the way, Psalm chapter 119, the longest psalm, the longest chapter in the whole Bible, is a chapter about the Word of God and the law of God. And he says, your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And when God speaks, then I know where to walk. I know how to go. Because I can see the path ahead of me. Because that is what his word does. And so he tells Habakkuk, this vision, the vision that I have for you, is for a future time. It describes the end. Read it with me. What does it say? And it will be. Oh, come on, somebody. And it will be. Oh. Yeah, the version says not delayed. By the way, almost none of the English versions say what the Hebrew actually says. What does it say in Hebrew? This vision is for a future time. It describes the end, and it will breathe. It will breathe. Everybody take a deep breath right now. You see... If you're alive, and everybody in the room is, your breathing happens automatically. You don't have to think about it. Your breathing is guaranteed by God himself. And he says, my word will breathe. It's a guarantee. That which I have said is going to happen. But breath is life. And His Word is life to us. So when He speaks, oh God, that's life. And it's a guarantee. And He says, if it seems slow, in coming. Wait patiently 
for it will surely take place. He says, if it seems slow, and then he jumps to, it will not be delayed. If it seems slow, it's going to happen, but it will not be delayed. But wait a minute. If it seems slow, is it not then delayed? God's timing is so different than ours. I'm sure you've watched enough Marvel movies by now to see people that are in the middle of destruction and the enemy is going after them and everything is horrible. And they're like, if we don't get rescued, if we don't get rescued, we are doomed. And it's all over. And of course the Avengers show up. But when do they show up? At the very last second before all, right before all is lost. I've heard recently testimonies of people that had stage four cancer and God supernaturally healed them. Now, how many praise God for that, right? That, that is good. Amen. But you might ask the question, God, why didn't you heal it when it was stage one? Why didn't you heal it at stage two? Why didn't you deal with it before I even got there? While it seems slow in coming, his answer is never, ever, ever delayed. Because his timing is simply not our timing. He knows what your heart needs. Some of us, what we really need is to learn to trust Jesus. So he's going, I'm keeping you waiting. So it might seem slow, but it will show up at the exact moment that it needs to. And when his answer comes, no matter what his answer is, it will give you exactly what you need. So right after verse 3, the whole rest of the chapter of chapter 2, God gives vision. God speaks. God makes clear the way that he works and what he was going to do. And so he makes that clear in the rest of chapter 2, and then we get right to the beginning of chapter 3. I don't want to share God's vision to Habakkuk. It's basically kind of about the Babylonians and what, how God works and what he does. But then we get to Habakkuk chapter 3 and we have his response. This man who decided, when I don't understand what's going on, God, I'm going to climb up into my watchtower and I'm standing guard until you tell me something. And then God told him something. And when he got the vision from God, it says this in chapter 3 verse 1. This prayer was what? Oh, my friends, you don't sing unless your heart has been filled with a joy that comes from the Lord. You don't sing your prayers unless you have come to a place of confidence and trust in your God. That when He speaks you, oh God, that is it. And then you sing. And so he sings his prayer. I'm not singing his prayer. But he sings. And in this prayer, he says, I have heard all about you, Lord. I am filled with awe by your amazing works. By the way, at this point, the Lord has done nothing yet. Nothing has happened. All he's gotten is a vision. And he goes, I am filled with awe by your amazing works in this time of our deep need. Help us again 
as you did in years gone by. And in your anger, remember your mercy. And then he says, I see God. I see God. Somebody say those three words with me. I see God. He goes, I see God moving across the deserts from Edom. The Holy One coming from Mount Paran. His brilliant splendor fills the heavens and the earth is filled with His praise. His coming is as brilliant as the sunrise. Rays of light flash from His hands where His awesome power is hidden. I see God. He didn't just capture a vision of what God does. He captured a vision of God Himself. And my friends, that is the revelation that we need. Would you wait until you see it? Wait until He speaks. Stop looking to the past. Stop worrying about the future. And stop walking your own path. But wait for the Lord to speak. And at the very end of chapter 3, when all is said and done, at the very end of this prayer of his song to the Lord, he says this, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, even though I have nothing at all right now, verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. And he says this, he makes me as sure-footed as a deer able to tread upon the heights. This is where he ends. I don't know what's up with the YouTube algorithm, but it decided to show me over the last week a bunch of mountain goats. I think God influenced the algorithm knowing what I was going to preach on. And you watch these mountain goats that stand up on the sides of mountains rock, steep. This isn't rolling hills. And they jump, but they jump from one spot to like 10 feet above it or 20 feet below it. If anybody in this room attempted such a thing, you would fall to your death immediately. Yet Habakkuk says, I am like those deer, like those mountain goats on the side of the mountain. My feet are so secure and so sure that I could walk on the most unstable of terrain and I will not fall. I can jump from here to there on the side of the mountain and I will stand firmly wherever I need to be because of the Lord who is my strength. So would you stand with me today? What do you do when you got more questions than answers? You wait. You wait until revelation comes and it will come. Because God is faithful. And when it comes, you grab a hold of it. And I cannot guarantee, no, I cannot, the type of answer the Lord will give. 
but he will answer. And as he answers, you will stand on the rock of Jesus Christ. Your feet will be secure. And you will walk forward on the path that the Lord has for you. So Jesus, today, we need you. We need you, Lord. And we don't want to be a people that look to the past. We don't want to keep our eyes focused on an unknown future. And we don't want to walk the path of the future in our own ideas, our own strength, our own power, and our own strategies. No, Lord, we will wait. We will wait on you, and we will wait for you because your word is life to us. Your word breathes in us. Your word transforms us. Your word gives us hope for the future. And so if you're here today, and whether you know Jesus or not, but you say, today I want to wait on God. I want to put my trust in Him. I want to be a person that stops trying my own way, and I just want to receive from the Lord. That, that's all I want to do. I just want to receive from the Lord. It's not about what you're going to do. It's not about what you need to produce. It's not about what you need to make happen. But you just want to say, Lord, today I want to learn to wait on you. I want to learn to trust in you. If that's you, raise up a hand or both of your hands. And Jesus, today, with these hands raised, Lord God, would you cause for my friends to come to a place of confidence in you, of trust in you, in you of hope in you and while the path that is marked out ahead of them has been a path that they have not been able to understand and one that they have not been able to see you make clear that it is your word that is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path and so speak lord speak lord speak lord we are watching until we see we are watching until we see a vision from you, Lord God, because we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That is how we live. And so, Jesus, today, we choose life in you. We choose hope in you. We choose peace in you. We choose security in you. We choose to trust in you because you are our, our life and we need you now we need you now the holy god there is no one like you lord jesus amen and amen